Um, so uh, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome to the 64th, no, 68th monthly meeting of the Strongly Sustainable Business Model Group. Uh, we are recording this meeting, and if you do not wish to be recorded, you should leave at this point. My name is Anthony Upwood, and I am one of the uh, four co-founders of this group, which was started at the beginning of 2012. So we're just starting our, our sixth uh, year. And uh, on the screen right now, there's a few uh, facts about the group which I won't uh, dwell on. Um, I wanted to start this meeting uh, in a slightly different way from uh, the way that we have been uh, doing things in the past uh, with something that increasingly we're doing here in Canada as a result of our truth and reconciliation uh, process with our own indigenous peoples. And I wanted to do a, an acknowledgement from two perspectives. Uh, one, firstly, a social acknowledgement, um, and secondly, a biophysical acknowledgement of, of where we are. Um, so obviously, we have an audience here from around the world, not only in Canada. Uh, so I've taken uh, what has been inspired by our truth and reconciliation process here and tried to genericize it. Um, so uh, wherever you are in the world today, you are on sacred land. And uh, where we are gathering here virtually, on all of this land, and we are privileged to be able to do that. Um, the land and the sea, wherever you are, uh, and the lake in our case here in Toronto, has supported human beings for thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of years, and is rich in history, knowledge, and tradition. And we are privileged to be the beneficiaries and the stewards of all that has come before, or on behalf of the seven generations to come, and even beyond. And we invite you to consider in your place, how do you honour and respect people indigenous to your place? That may be you, it may not be you. So how do you honour and respect those peoples? And today, in this place, Toronto, around the world, we are increasingly home to people who did not come from the place in which we are. And for those of us who are, in fact, new arrivals in that place, we are very grateful to be here in those places. So an acknowledgement of our, of our social privilege, wherever we are, whatever situation we find ourselves in. The second is this place. So I'm going to focus now on the place that we are here physically in Toronto, um, in downtown Toronto. This is the building at which we're in. Um, I invite you to consider where you are right now. What is the watershed? What biophysical space are you in? Here in Toronto, we're sitting on the edge of a watershed known by the settlers here as Russell Creek. And we, they, buried that creek in the, 19, in the 1870s and it, uh, as a sewer. Uh, and uh, despite quite a bit of research on my part, I've not yet been able to track down an indigenous name for Russell Creek, but I'm sure there were many indigenous names for this place. So I invite you to consider where are you? What watershed are you in? Do you know what watershed you're in today? And I'd like you to think about the fact that this co-creative session we're doing today is interdependent on that place. Uh, you probably drank some water, you probably will go to the bathroom, and you are dependent on your watershed for both of those things. And for those of you who know the Flourishing Business Canvas, this is why on the Flourishing Business Canvas we include markets and stocks and ecosystem services to get us to think about the place in which our organisations are based. Um, very quickly, the SSBMG, for those of you who don't know us, uh, we're a global community of innovation practice. We are a knowledge mobilisation initiative hosted by the Ontario College of Art and Science University Strategic Innovation Lab. And we, the members of this group, collaborate to design innovative business models, measurement systems, reporting approaches, mental models, implementation frameworks, methods and tools, with a particular focus on small and medium enterprises, helping them realise strongly sustainable, flourishing, thriving outcomes. And we reached impact by enabling all of you individually to contribute to the community in your own context while meeting your own needs. So economic, social and environmental needs, all of us focused on the idea of doing good to do well. So I just wanted to start this week month's presentation with a very quick introduction. So moving on to our speaker today, we are absolutely delighted to have uh, Michelle Holliday, who is uh, a long-time member of this group. This is the first time, however, she's presented to us. Uh, and partly what sparked this is uh, a wonderful new book, which I'm uh, about halfway through now, 
um, very much enjoying myself, uh, the age of tribability based on uh, deep experience that uh, she has had over the last uh, number of years. And I had the privilege of meeting Michelle face to face in Montreal. Just before she took the, that, was, that was great and set up, uh, set up this opportunity. Uh, again, just a reminder, the uh, URL here is where the meeting agenda and minutes are. If you want to learn, get a bit more background and see who's here, I'll be adding the agenda to the moment. And uh, if you haven't done so already, please put your name, preferred organization or affiliation, and location in the Zoom chat. So with that, Michelle, I will end my uh, screen share here and uh, okay. in the take over. Okay. Find how to spot that this day. Okay, so Michelle is now going to share her presentation. And Michelle, over to you. Thank you. Now I have to find it here. It's wonderful to be here. Uh, and let me see if I can find my presentation. Where did it go? <laughs> we had it. We had it. Sorry, I messed up there. I'm going to, let's see. I see it. It's in the background. Can you, you can see that, right? Not yet, no. You can't see my, oh. Ah. All right. Sorry, I met my, I changed things around on this at the last minute. <laughs> we were all ready. Yes, my fault. Right. It's okay. So let's see if I can do two things at once. I can uh, talk and tell you about myself a little bit while I look for my presentation. Can you see me? Yes, yeah. you can see. Okay. <laughs> can you see my confused face as I, as I look? Um, where could it have gone? All right. We're back now. Can you see that? No, designing for thriving? No, we still just still see you. No. Okay, we're getting closer. Um, we need share screen. Yes. Yes. We have success. Okay. All right, so I'm Michelle and um, Darn, there we go. Now you see the cover page, right? That is correct. Okay. So um, I've been in this work for about 20 years. This work being um, trying to invite people to expand the story that they use to understand organizations, communities, economies, um, from seeing them as machines to seeing them as living systems. And uh, I got started in this work uh, before 20 years ago. I started out in a corporate career. I worked for two large multinational corporations and I worked internationally in brand strategy and marketing. And it was exciting work. It, there was um, a lot to learn. It was good in a lot of ways. And at the same time, it was absolutely soul crushing and disillusioning <laughs> in ways that were confusing to me because they were both um, highly respected companies. I worked for Coca-Cola and H.J. Hines and, uh, and we were successful at what we, were, we, we set out to do. But it, it just, um, something was not in alignment with my values. And, and I, I wasn't yet sure what that something was. And so I left uh, large corporations and I left marketing and moved into organizational development and uh, organizational culture and leadership. And that felt a bit better uh, to my values and to my body. Um, I, I had started to feel sick at the, the larger corporate jobs but I still felt that there was a fundamental mismatch and a misalignment. And, and the more I thought about it, the more I realized that it came down to this story, the machine story that tells us that we're, we're separate from each other, we're separate from nature, we're separate from the organization that we work in, uh, whether we're employees or customers, and that uh, we exist just to compete and consume, and that busyness and productivity are their own reward, all of that uh, I came to understand stems from a story that uh, a worldview and a paradigm that says the, the entire universe is just one big clockwork mechanism. 
and it makes sense when we have that story. All of those, those things that we, we were told to believe about our organizations make sense within that story. But my instinct was that there was also life in our organizations and in us and in, in society and our communities. And so uh, about 20 years ago, I went in search of life on earth and, and in our organizations and um, discovered some core conditions and characteristics that are present in any living ecosystem and in our organizations and that we have to cultivate if we're um, going to enable that organization to thrive. So that's what I want to share with you today, the things that I, I discovered in my research and that I've been bringing to organizations ever since. The way that I bring that to organizations is a mix of things. I do consulting and it feels more like accompaniment than, than consulting, really. Guiding organizational clients, primarily small and medium, in, in understanding this new story and what it means for them, what they want to, to do with that new story, uh, using a, a framework that I'll share. I also write uh, a book in particular, as Anthony said, and I write articles and blog posts quite frequently. And I host public and, and private conversations and, and that's quite a, an important word for me. I think that when we're shifting stories, shifting worldviews, there's nothing more than information to help us integrate that, that story and come to understand what it means for us. So that's kind of the shape of the work I do, primarily in Montreal, but more and more uh, globally as well. So before I get into the living systems, patterns and framework, I want to just go back to the machine story a bit and make sure it's clear what the limitations are of that story, why it's not enough. Because it has been useful. The machine story has been useful. Uh, we've, we've achieved some great things based on this machine story, but I want to share two examples that help point out uh, the, the shortcomings of that machine story. The first one is within Six Sigma, and many of you are, are probably aware of this approach to uh, continuous improvement and, and quality improvement. It's very popular, used by tens of thousands of organizations around the world. And within Six Sigma, there's a model called SIPOC. SIPOC stands for Suppliers, Inputs, Processes, Outputs, and Customer. And within that model, this is you. You are considered, you as an employee, are considered a supplier of inputs along with other inputs. So you bring your talent and your energy and you input it into the organization, which is thought to be just the process, just the, the mechanism and, and, um, and flow of processes within the organization. So you are external to those processes and out the other side of these processes come outputs that land in the lap of a waiting customer. This is also external to the, the organization. And if it's not working, then we re-engineer it, right? So again, this has been a useful story, a useful way of, of conceptualizing organizations. We've made a lot of progress using models like this that simplify and frame organizations in a particular way, in a particularly mechanistic way. But the problem comes in when we recognize the things that are excluded from models like these, from this way of thinking of the organization. It ex excludes things like the natural environment. It excludes community and health and passion and creativity and all the things that really make us human and alive and that make it worth coming together in organization to do work together. So, um, this is a, a small example of, of some of the dangers that we find in, in the limitations of a machine story. The, the other example I'll offer is just in our language. And, and Bob, you and I were talking about language and how uh, we all have our own. And in some ways, it doesn't really matter, but sometimes it does. And when we talk about ourselves as human resources and human capital, as employees, and, and you know, in French, employé means a thing that is used. It refers to something that is used. When we talk about managing talent as if it's a commodity or an input that can be considered separately from the human being who, who carries it, 
who embodies it. This is dehumanizing. It, it, it falls short of recognizing the full aliveness that we bring. And this famous phrase that is supposed to be a great compliment, our employees are our best assets, I find to be really quite insulting. I'm not an asset. I'm a human being. I'm, I'm so much more than, than some company's asset. So um, <laughs> all of this is, is sort of the surface level indicators of a story that, um, that only reveals some of what's going on in our organizations. And in falling short, it really has led us to some good things, but also to some pretty disastrous outcomes. It's, it's showing signs of coming to the end of its usefulness as the complete story that we have about organizations and economies and communities. So let's look at what more is possible. When I talk about this new story of organizations as living systems and communities as living systems, I am... My work is to invite people into a story of thriveability. This is an, an invented word. Uh, I don't know if it was invented by me. Uh, I discovered other people using it around the same time that I thought, hey, it's about thriveability. <laughs> so there, there's a growing global movement of champions of this concept of um, aiming for creating the conditions for life to thrive not only sustaining but but thriving and not only surviving but thriving and so for me this is about inviting people into the informed intention and practice of stewarding life of of creating the fertile conditions for life to thrive and each of these words has powerful meaning to them so to be informed uh, if we're going to steward life, if we're going to create the conditions for life to thrive, we have to know what does that involve? What does that mean? What does that require of us? So it's important that we go in with a certain level of, of awareness and information, either from different frameworks, mine or, or other people's, um, or from uh, indigenous wisdom, from the perennial philosophy of, uh, of Aldous Huxley, uh, the, the wisdom traditions, or even from our own intuitions. It's important to, to give it some thought, what, what's needed here in order to create the conditions for life to thrive. So we, we need to go in with the informed intention. And, and here, this is a, a really critical piece. You know, human beings in general today fall short of setting the intention of Creating the conditions for life to thrive. We set lesser goals for ourselves than that. And as a result, we're getting something decidedly less than thriving. So it's important to be clear. The intention, our commitment is to enable life to thrive at every level for individuals working within an organization, for the organization as a living system, for customers, for community, for the biosphere. It's important to be clear that that's the goal. And then practice. By this, I, I do mean tactics and, and what we might call best practices or good practices. And there are so many new practices that we're discovering and, and sharing that are more aligned with life and, and with how life flows and operates. But what I mean most of all by this is an ongoing practice, like a, a life practice, a, a martial arts practice or a spiritual practice, because aligning with life, being in service of life, stewarding life is not something that we, we put on our daily to-do list and then we're done with it. It's something that, uh, that we do over time, that we, we work on growing in our ability to respond with wisdom and compassion. And this is something that really is an, an ongoing life practice. So finally, this idea of stewarding life about it, it is about creating the conditions for life to thrive but there's also again depth behind the concept in my book i write about how when we when we see something as alive when we really see it as alive the 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 only appropriate response is reverence you know if you and uh, if you find your pulse 
on, on the side of your neck and you really notice your own aliveness. If you pause to, to realize you're alive, this is amazing. There's wonder and awe and reverence in that. And reverence in recognizing that life is beyond our control. We, we, we can cultivate the conditions for life to thrive. We can, um, we can care for it, but we can never really know the full potential of any living system, any living being uh, or ecosystem. So uh, we have that, that reverence for the mystery and paradoxically, we also feel called to, to be responsible, to care, even though we can't control it. And so that, that combination of reverence and responsibility is how I define stewardship. So all of that is, is within the practice of thriveability for me, the informed intention and practice of stewarding life. It's no small thing, huh? <laughs> but we start anywhere and, and follow it everywhere. So let me get into the informed part of that equation. And I, I want to tell you about the, the characteristics and conditions of living systems that I work with. And as you'll see, they're intuitive. This is biology, but it's, it's, I, I find uh, it's intuitive and relatively easy to grasp. So these are the conditions that we have to cultivate if we're going to uh, create the fertile conditions for life to thrive. And, and let me just pause and say, uh, please interrupt at any time if you have questions or comments. I'll try to pause myself so that I'll give you a chance to. Okay. Michelle, I, I yeah. have one question. That was a very eloquent and moving introduction you've just provided us. Um, many of us are doing work in, in organizational settings. When you present to people who, for example, are in companies such as the ones you used to work for, what sort of reactions do you get to that, uh, that uh, introduction that you just gave us? Mm -hmm. If this were a corporate setting, I probably would have eased my way in a bit more gently. But because we are the strongly sustainable business model group, <laughs> my sense was that I didn't have to ease in. Um, so, um, yeah, this might have been a lot for, <laughs> for Coca-Cola to take on all at once. Yeah, I'm, I'm just thinking if there's a quick way I can tell you about how I would have started it out, but um, much more scientifically. And I, you know, I, I went into my research 20 years ago with quite a scientific focus, thinking that I needed to offer a bridge from the mechanistic and linear uh, mindset into recognition of aliveness and thriving. So you'll see some of my emphasis on science here is a result of that. All right. Okay, so these are the four conditions that we have to cultivate. And the first is that every living system has individual parts. So there are bees in a beehive, there are cells in your body, and there are people in an organization. And the more diverse or divergent those parts can be in their expression and in their contributions, the more likely that living system is to thrive, to be resilient and creative and adaptive. And we know that, right, from, from biodiversity. So already you've got one. <laughs> you know one of these already. So the second characteristic or condition of thriving living systems is that those parts come together in a pattern of relationship. So in beehives, for example, uh, there are many patterns of relationship. One of them is that bees have a, a set of, of dance moves, <laughs> which is kind of fun. And that's how they communicate. So there are little bee dances, and some of them communicate that there's food here, and some communicate that there's a predator coming. Um, so this is a pattern of relationship that is consistent and yet responsive. Uh, according to changing circumstances. In our bodies, we have a circulatory system and a digestive system, a, a skeletal system. These are all the, the structures and systems that, uh, that connect us and support us internally and externally in relationship. 
And it's again, consistent, but responsive. So our, our temperature, for example, our body is able to maintain a consistent temperature, but that is responsive to changing external uh, conditions. So in our organizations, this is the structures and systems that support and connect us in being in relationship with each other. So it's, it's desks and it's meetings and it's uh, buildings and cash registers, everything that allows us and language um, and, and um, frameworks that allow us to be in relationship with each other consistently, but adaptively and responsibly over time. All right, so there are parts that come together in relationship and the more free flowing and open the relationships can be, the more resilient and adaptive and responsive the living system is likely to be. The third characteristic is that the parts come together in relationship and create a new level of life, an emergent level of life, a whole, an emergent whole. So uh, the bees come together in patterns of relationship and they create a hive. And by this, I don't mean the structure, I mean the super organism that is all the bees together and their swarm intelligence, their ability to find the best uh, sources of food or find the best new place to put a hive or to regulate the temperature of that hive structure to keep it within two degrees in either direction. And that's not any one bee that's able to do that. That's the whole of them together as an emergent property of the living system. In our bodies, it's that we are uh, more than just a collection of cells, right? You are able to think and feel and move, and those are things that happen at the level of the whole of you, not at the level of your cells. And in our organizations, it's purpose, shared purpose, that brings us together and creates emergent capabilities, like the ability to, to handle complex tasks, like the emergence of culture, things that aren't a function of any one person, but are sort of the, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. And that's what we're after, right? The magic of, of living systems is these emergent capabilities and characteristics. And here, what we want if the living system is to thrive is not the divergence that we find at the level of the parts, but it's convergence. So it's one of those paradoxes of living systems that we want lots of divergence within a high level of convergence. So for example, your, your cells are continuously replaced, but you remain recognizably you. So that's divergence within convergence at the level of the whole. Organizations remain focused on a single purpose over time. And, and the, the organization is recognizable even as people come and go because of convergence around the wholeness and around purpose. So the more consistency and coherence there is at the level of the whole, the more the living system is likely to thrive. So at this point, <clears throat> with these first three characteristics and conditions, we could be talking about my car. My car has individual parts. They come together in relationship with each other and with me and with the road. And together, they create a new whole that now has the emergent quality, it's, it's now called my car, a vehicle, and it has the emergent capability of moving me around town that didn't exist when it was just a collection of parts. But my car will never have a great idea. My car can never heal itself. If it gets broken, it can't regenerate itself. It only uh, degrades over time. My car will never be my friend. It will never make me a new car. Those are all the things that uh, are, are the real magic that we're after in a living system that are desirable in any living system and in an organization in particular. And for those, there's, there's something else that's needed. And that's what some biologists call a self-integrating property. So that means that by itself, the living system integrates parts divergent parts into dynamic relationship in a way that creates a convergent whole with emergent properties and characteristics. It's a self-integrating property. For me, it's just life. It's whatever spark it is that animates us and makes us alive. 
It's the difference between me and my car. And we don't have to know what exactly it is or where it comes from. We could debate that forever and ever. The important thing is just to acknowledge that it is, that it is self-organizing, self-healing, self-managing, um, self-integrating, and that therefore our role is really to cultivate these other conditions, to create the conditions for life to do what it does naturally. So here in, in naming life, let me see if I have to uncover there, <laughs> the new story of aliveness and of thriving and of thrivability invites us to see ourselves not as drivers of a machine and engineers, re-engineering the organization, but as stewards or gardeners of something precious and alive that we can't control, but we can care for and cultivate. We see that the purpose shifts to contributing more aliveness and thriving in ways that only we can. The purpose is not only to be connected in transaction, but to invite transformation. This is life's fundamental urge to connect with other forms of life in order to be transformed. So our organizations can be places of transformation for, for us. And in fact, they can be powerful playgrounds and practice grounds for being fully human and alive. So just a recap before I pause again for questions and before I get into um, the framework that puts these into an organizational context. Let me, let me um, pause and see if you have questions about these core <clears throat> characteristics of thriving living systems. Does it make sense? It, it certainly does. Um, I, I, and I know from your book just how deeply and broadly you did the research <laughs> to be able to summarize so much into just four points. Mm -hmm. uh, other than reading your book, uh, where would you suggest people might go to, if they wanted to go deeper into this, into this thinking, if, if you were to point at one or two mm -hmm. resources, where, what would you recommend? I have a slideshow that goes into a bit more detail. And I tell a story in the beginning of the book, you might remember, Anthony. you see these everywhere once you are sort of attuned to this. And when I discovered these um, in my research, I started to see them everywhere and then thought I was losing my mind. It was just that it came right after I had seen this movie called A Beautiful Mind. Um, who's the actor? Do you remember? Oh, <laughs> Russell Crowe. Russell Crow. That's it. And he's schizophrenic. And so he's seeing patterns in everything. And I thought, oh no, it's me too. <laughs> but you know, I just realized if it's a, a core set of patterns that life uses to connect and create, then it makes sense that we would see it in, in just about everywhere we look at, at every level of our existence. So I have a chapter about the brain and about um, the evolution of humanity over time and about how we evolve as individuals in our maturity and in our consciousness. So if, if you can't take the time to look at the, the slideshow or read the book, then, then just keep this list handy and notice when something in your life is working. Is it because um, you as an individual have fertile conditions for your own thriving? Is it because the relationships are open and free flowing. Is it because there's shared purpose that creates a, a whole that's greater than the sum of, of its parts? Do you feel like you're, you're really part of something bigger than yourself? And, and where can you find reverence for life and, and how it works through you in some ways? So, One of the things we did in leadership development in IBM Canada was looking for metaphors for good leadership. Mm -hmm. and, uh, one of the ones we used quite a lot was the, um, the metaphor of a garden and gardeners. Nice. Um, as to what effective leadership would look like. And um, we found that that whole idea of providing an environment that allowed things to grow, to mm -hmm. nurture them and so on, um, was very helpful in encouraging a leadership style that was not... <laughs> 
yelling at the plants and uh, stuff. Right. And, right, and so on. Um, the fertilizer part of the metaphor got a little iffy, but anyway, the, the, the idea of nurturing right. a garden uh, of yeah. things and so on um, was, we thought, a very appropriate metaphor and uh, very aligned with the, the theme that you're talking about here. Wonderful. So let me offer another metaphor along those lines, very similar. Uh, the metaphor of a tree. When I think of these patterns that we have to cultivate if we want an organization to thrive, I think about the, the, the individual people within the organization as being represented by the roots. We know a, a, a big, strong, healthy tree needs a broad and diverse root base so that it has access to many different sources of nutrients. And so it's just strong enough to hold up the, the weight of the tree, right? So I, I think that I imagine people being represented by the roots and the life that they bring in kind of flowing in through the ground. When I think about the wholeness, and um, I mentioned that in, in a human community and in an organization, what brings us together in, in emergent, convergent wholeness is our shared purpose to serve a customer or a community generally, then we can imagine that being represented by the branches and the leaves and the fruit of the tree. This is our offering up and out into the world that brings us together. That's why we come together and who we are together. And then when we think about relationship, it's that supportive, connective, space between us and between us and, and customer and, and community. So we can imagine it represented by the trunk as the connective infrastructure of our organization. And here, the metaphor of a tree is especially useful because I learned that most of the trunk of a tree is actually dead. There's just a thin layer of living tissue right under the bark that's called the cambium. And that's where life flows through from the roots up to the leaves and fruit and from the leaves and the light and life of the sun back down to the roots. So the reason I point this out is that if we think back to that SIPOC model of the, the Six Sigma machine story that saw what we're calling here the trunk, saw the infrastructure as the organization and people as external to it, we can see that it, it puts us in worship and, and service to the non-living part <laughs> of the organization. And that may be why it feels so deadening to be in an organization uh, oriented in that way. It's the, it's the definition of bureaucracy. When you are in service of infrastructure, when you're in service of process and, and meetings, and not in service of the life within the organization. And when we take this whole metaphor and the living system story into account, we can see that the whole system is the organization. In, in French, even the word for organization is organism. It's, it's all the organism, not just the infrastructure. That infrastructure, I, I, you know, it's, it's dead except for the living tissue of the cambium, but it's still important. We need it to, to support and connect, and especially to support and, and raise up the leaves to the light and life of the sun, right? And to, to help us connect with each other and, and to make an offering out to our customers and to our community. So it's necessary, but it's not the whole organization, and it's certainly not the purpose of the organization. It's not what we're in service of. We're in service of the, the whole flow of the, the entire living ecosystem. How's that for a metaphor? <laughs> you got it? Yep. Okay. All right, so let's get into a little bit more detail. We still need to know what does that mean? How do I cultivate the divergent parts at the root base here? How do I cultivate purpose and wholeness and convergence? So now we're gonna get into some more detail. If, we, if you can see in the background there, we still have the tree metaphor. And at the branches, we've got the, per, 
the purpose, the wholeness that brings us together in service of customer and community. And so the questions here might be, who are we serving? And what is our project? If we, we go back down to the roots and the individual people, the divergent parts, right? Then here, what, what we're really talking about is their passion. How do we create the conditions for people to bring the best of themselves, their energy, their ideas, their, their aliveness? So I think of that as inviting people's passion. And then if we think about the level of the trunk of infrastructure and relationship here, I think about that as practical play. And here the questions are, what is our playground and what are the rules? And in fact, I skipped the questions under passion. How can we serve the project and how can the project serve us? So back to practical play. The reason I like this phrase, besides that it starts with two Ps, and I like alliteration, is that I think we make a huge mistake when we uh, tell ourselves that play is the opposite of work. Play is the, the very best, most effective way that we can do our work. It's the way we innovate best, it's the way we collaborate best, it's the way we learn best. Play is sort of the, the highest form of work. And so uh, as we design our infrastructure, our, our supportive and connective space, the more it feels like play and joy and learning, those are signals that we're, we're designing for thriving. So that my point here is not uh, gamification, as a, as a strategy necessarily. The point is that um, we, we need to design for joy and learning and play and life as, as much as we can, as fully as we can. So we'll go into some even further detail. How do we cultivate passion? How do we invite it into our organizations? The first thing I have found that cultivates the conditions for individual thriving is mastery, helping people find ways to do their jobs well. We all want to do our jobs well, right? But we want to do it not in a, a robotic way. We want to do it in, in the sense of a master craftsman so that uh, we bring something of ourselves to our, to our work. We do it in ways that no one else could do quite like we can. And we do it in ways that we're continuously learning, like beginner's mind, you know? And so we might say, I am awesome and getting better as we pursue our mastery. So this is the first condition that we cultivate together as an organization. How can each of us reach a feeling of mastery continuously and progressively over time? The second condition that we have to cultivate is membership. People want to feel that they're great at their jobs and that they, they belong. They belong to a team, to a great organization, to great customers and, and community. So the more levels and depth of, of membership that can be cultivated, the more life is invited into the organization. And finally, there's meaning. People want to feel that it's more than just a paycheck, that they're deeply proud of what they do and that their work is, is worthy of their best talents and energy. So like the garden metaphor, this is, this is sort of our garden plot and, and we can zoom in on any one of these, but we can also look for ways that um, these can flow into each other. Right? There's a dotted line be between all of these different conditions that have to be cultivated over time. They, they, um, they complement each other and they, they can be made to align with each other. All right, so let's look at purpose and how do we... So, uh, yes. Michelle, I, I, um, Bob and I just uh, observing, uh, just as a comment, uh, many of us in the group are, are familiar with the, the framework for strategic sustainable development and the recent evolution uh, of that to have a, a much stronger social focus, not just an environmental one. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the mapping of the first three of the details that you've put up here uh, to uh, some of the ideas in that uh, are, uh, are astonishingly aligned. I mean, even in the choice of words, uh, it, it's mm -hmm. very, very aligned. Wonderful. 
I'm, I'm sure it's not a coincidence, you know? Uh, it, I'm sure it isn't. <laughs> right. We're, we're all circling in on some of the yeah. same insights. Fantastic. Okay, so if we want to cultivate purpose, and, and here, you know, if we think back to that tree metaphor, what we're really doing is inviting in the customer and their life and their money and their relationships, all that, that um, is, we want to invite to flow in um, into our living ecosystem. So the first thing we have to do generally is, is offer them something. This is what we do in our organizations. We make a contribution to our customer or our community. And, you know, technically this is our, our commodity, our product or our service that I'm talking about here. And most companies really at their core think of it in terms of their commodity. This is our thing that we're offering. And this is where uh, that Six Sigma model really comes in handy. We're going to keep adding features and we're going to keep improving it over time and, and we'll keep an eye on our competitors so that we, we add the same features that they have or maybe better. But it's a dangerous place to be. It's a dangerous place to stay for sure because we know that commodities end up only in price competition. So it's really a, a, a terrible and deadening and not sustainable place to be. So uh, even just the choice of word, um, of contribution already invites us to think more expansively about our offering. How can we make a contribution to our customers' lives in some way so that they, they feel that it's something really great? So we want even more life from them, more engagement, more relationship from them. And so the next thing we do is to offer them a sense of community and conversation and maybe even co-creation so that our offering they, they, they might say, your offering is for people like me. And you can see, this is where we're heading. We, when I worked at Coca-Cola 20 years ago, we were not in community at all, in, in the sense that um, building a personal relationship, but now you've got bottles that have your own name on them. You, you look for your own uh, personal bottle of Coca-Cola. You've got your, um, your personal songs that you can download, thanks to Coca-Cola. So, this is absolutely where um, companies are going. So we wanna build community and conversation and responsiveness, right? If we want even more loyalty, even more life and engagement, then we give people a heroic cause. We stand for something so that they might say, I'm just happy that you exist. I feel that way about Patagonia and, and I actually, I've never bought anything from Patagonia, but I follow them on social media and I, I'm, I'm happy that they exist. And, and one of these days I am going to buy something from them. So I, I want to share two observations about this, this row of, of conditions in our garden. Uh, one is that it doesn't have to be something um, obviously charitable, this heroic cause concept in particular. One of the examples that I give most often is Harley Davidson because they have technically excellent motorcycles, really fantastic motorcycles. They've got an amazing and strong community of Harley owners. The Harley owners group is the hogs and, and the company cultivates it, but, but it's also self, um, self organizing and the heroic cause for the 35 to 45 year old accountants and lawyers who make up the majority of Harley Davidson customers is if you ask them, they might be able to articulate that it's, it's something around rebellion and the open road and freedom that they don't have in their, their day jobs, but they get to experience that when they're, when they're riding a Harley. So, you know, there, there are ways to think about uh, what heroic cause means to you and to, to your community that are beyond the, the short list of, of obvious things. The second point I want to make about uh, purpose and, and these conditions is that when I started working with this framework, I naturally started left to right, as I did in explaining it. And, um, and I think that's how most companies operate still, that we start with what do we want to sell people? And then how could we 
get some community around it? You know, how can we get a following on social media? And then how can we slap on a heroic cause? You know, and, and years ago, that was donating 2% of profits to a charity or having a foundation. And, and we're starting to see more meaningful, um, I, I guess, heroic causes that are more integrated. What I have found is that it's infinitely more powerful to come at it from the other direction what do we together stand for? What do we care about? What are the problems we see in the world that we want to address or the opportunities? What's the community that already exists that we can be part of and, and contribute to? And then what is the offering that, and the contribution that only we can make? That we have some special, unique um, ability to, to offer. So it's, it's sort of Simon Sinek's start with why. I, I'm so glad you said that. That's exactly what I was, what was coming to my mind. We, we've been, many of us in the group have been using Simon Sinek's mm -hmm. uh, uh, Golden Circle, why, how, what, uh, in our work to bring many of the tools and methods that we have been developing in the group to, to, to the world. Mm -hmm. and, and we're finding exactly the same observation that you are and, and that Simon found that the why uh, mm -hmm. is the place to start on the, on the right of each other. The other thing that's popping into my head, uh, looking at this, uh, is um, uh, connecting back to storytelling. Yes. And if we think of the most powerful stories that we have in our cultures, um, you know, one example is the hero's journey. And the mm -hmm. hero's journey is all, all about a heroic cause and making me. And, and of course, the other things to the left of the rightmost column are then story elements. How does the hero build community? Uh, on their journey, um, mm -hmm. how do the members of the people with the hero become a, a, a cohesive group? Mm -hmm. um, what contribution does each member, each member of that group now play towards the heroic cause? Mm -hmm. And those stories all have these elements to them. Mm -hmm. And they improve their mastery, actually, you know, that they have to learn things on their journey to be able to accomplish things. I mean, it, it, yeah. it's, the mapping is just amazing to the storytelling. Mm -hmm. so, it's true. It's true. I, I often talk about or in, ask organizations that I work with, what's, what is the story, the unfolding story that you're living out and what's the next chapter and how do you want to live into it? Exactly. It's missing. A, a, a big part of my work is helping organizations craft a manifesto. So it's another way of, of crafting their story concisely. So let's get through the final row here of infrastructure and practical place. So the first thing we need is structure. And you might have noticed that like the branches and the roots of a tree are mirror images of each other. In the same way, the top row and the bottom row are really mirror images of each other. So our, our offering really has to be aligned with our mastery. And the structure exists to connect those two. So here, um, it's, it's about having the support we need to make our offer. And this is maybe the desks and the, the cash registers and the office space. Maybe it's a particular business model, whatever it is that we need to be able to connect our, our mastery to our contribution. In the next spot, we have systems. And this is really connecting us in flow of, of getting things done, sharing information and making decisions. So connecting, um, connecting our membership to our community, but also, uh, again, there's, there's dotted lines between because in some cases it's hard to know, is it a structure or is it a system? It, it, whatever the connective supportive infrastructure that you need is what we're after. And finally, sustainability. And here, I don't mean it, it in the, the most popular sense of recycling and, uh, and corporate responsibility. Those, those are included, but what I really mean is sustainability of the living system that is the organization. So it's about strategies and disciplines of reflection and renewal, reflecting on whether we are living our heroic cause are we experiencing meaningful work? Is our mastery aligned with that heroic cause? Is our membership 
uh, really aligned with the structure? Is the structure serving our, our membership or is it impeding it in some way? Um, how are we doing in our story? Uh, and is there something that we want to renew, to evolve and, and adapt? And is there a need to pause and, um, and rest? What are the rhythms that, we, um, that would be most healthy for us? So this is really what I, what I mean most by sustainability here. It's about reflecting and, and renewing, learning and evolving over time. It's, it's sustaining thrivability. Exactly, exactly. So we talked about the kind of mirror image of purpose and passion. One way to think about how these line up, these columns, is body, mind, spirit. The, the first column is the very tangible um, and, and concrete physical aspects of our, our work together. The middle column is the more uh, relational and the final is the, the most ethereal, the least tangible, but really the most powerful, the most transformational. So it might be easier to think of it as doing, relating, and being, or as you said, Anthony, the, the why, how, what of Simon Sinek. So that might help frame how all of these fit together. And then the last, last piece, is stewardship, that all of it is held together by a, a stance of stewardship, that our work is to cultivate these fertile conditions over time, to have that informed intention and practice of stewarding life, to recognize that we are not so much engineers as we are gardeners. Michelle, um, I, I'm just reflecting on you on those alternative labeling of the columns that you were just putting up a moment ago, mm -hmm. and you had being there on the on the right side. Um, and um, I was wondering, uh, John Ehrenfeld has has talked quite a lot recently about his shift from using the word his shift from having, which is of course very dominant in our culture today, towards being, and then going beyond being uh, to caring. Mm. Um, which comes back to the stewardship idea. Have yeah. you, do you still prefer the word being to caring, or where are you, where are you on that? Hmm. I, you know, it's the first time I'm I'm being offered the choice, and I'm just instinctively, my reaction is to say caring seems to be that stewardship piece. It's caring for all of it, caring for the doing, the relating, and the being. That I'd have to think about it some more. That's my my quick reaction. Yeah, that's a good, good question, Anthony. Uh, I, I know John is where John is coming from with being is that when you've developed that place of being, that caring is going to emerge. You don't have to. It, it's an emergent property that would come out of that if you're you're going to if you're living in a place of being instead of having to do. So mm -hmm. I think it's I think it, it emerges that caring might be one expression of it. Rian Eisler talks about that as well, and the the caring economy and and the uh, relationship a partnership against dominating systems which you're speaking to here as well michelle mm -hmm, mm -hmm. are you are you taking more questions at this point too yes, or uh, observations so sure in uh, when i when i look at this model i can see how it might be used in a relationship to the flourishing business canvas as a way to have um uh, what, you know what we call we, we've got ecosystem actors and stakeholders and and of course we've got different ways of looking at participants in the relationships uh, within it within an organization uh, with the, the customers <laughs> stakeholders in the community and with uh, natural and social system uh, actors that are part of the larger ecology mm -hmm. and one thing that we don't I mean, we maybe have different ways of doing, but we really haven't. We haven't uh, formally designed a, a way to construct um, um, the commitment of, of an actor to, you know, to its relationships in the ecosystem that we're creating um, with that business model. That's a very different way of looking at a business model, where instead of the organization providing a value proposition, which then is taken out to its its customers, where its customers would be stakeholders, and then you have a 
a value relationship. Uh, what's intended in the flourishing model is is, uh, a, is an understanding and a relationship to many different actors that may not be present at the time that you're constructing the model. Mm -hmm. So what we don't have is a good way to think of them as individuals in an empathic way where we can construct their stories tied to um, the uh, ecosystem of, of this relational business model in a way that, so I could see using something like the DNA to construct our individual um, kind of models of how we individually thrive within mm -hmm. flourishing. I yeah. also say that your use of thrivability is consistent with Alexander Laszlo's in the uh, International Society of System Sciences for about the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. He's been developing a kind of systems theory of, of thrivability, which is very consistent with the individual flourishing within the ecosystem within their actually stewardship. And so there are a lot of the way that that kind of thrivability has independently formed. And by the way, Anthony, you probably know Alexander is Chris Laszlo's brother. Mm -hmm. Christopher Laszlo being the um, primary author in the Flourishing Enterprise book and one of our partners. Mm -hmm. And so Alexander. So this, these relationships between thrivability and flourishing, actually they, they do refer to different things that mm -hmm. are developed in literature. They're very closely related, but it may be an easy way of looking at it is that thrivability is does get to this beingness and the flourishing is the is the emergence of you know of the whole flourishing you can talk about a flourishing individual but we're talking about flourishing ecosystems essentially that are like blooming and emerging and and and, and flowing together but the thrive this is very close to how how Laszlo looks at and mm -hmm. but what they we don't have is a way to telling the individual story and I think that there's something here that could be, you know, develop that level of commitment within our process. Mm -hmm. Fantastic, thank you. Not, you're, you're reminding me that I've been gathering translations of the word flourishing in other languages and adding them to the wiki. Um, and uh, it would be a, quite an interesting exercise. In many, many languages, what we're finding is that there is no good translation mm -hmm. of flourishing. Um, people tend to translate it into what in English we would say blooming, which of course doesn't have all the connotations that, that um, flourishing does, um, and and I, I sort of understand the distinction you're making between flourishing and thriving. But I, I think uh, it would be useful if, if in our members we we, skip, we asked also the question: What's the translation of thriving? Mm -hmm. That may be better translations in other languages of thriving compared to flourishing. <laughs> um, and uh, it, you know, the, the important thing is that they are highly interrelated terms, and they help to create a big tent for what it is that we're doing and, and how we're trying to explain to people. And, and help people experience and understand um, the opportunity uh, that's in front of us. So I, I'll add that to the wiki now, and, and uh, we'll, we'll take it from there. Great. Uh, just, a quick, uh, just a quick sorry. remark, uh, Michelle, if you remember um, our conversation with Manuel Manga in Oakland um, three years ago about flourishing versus thriving. So I will make sure that 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 I refer this recording to him. <laughs> I oh, think good. <laughs> Thank you. Setting up the connection. Thank you, Anthony. Yeah. Good. Oh. And my experience is that thrivability is is just as difficult to translate, um, and, and it leads to my my story. I, I have two stories to share if we have time, uh, but the the closest translation into French that I've come up with, someone offered it to me, was vitabilité, which is the combination of uh, vitality and viability. So that's that's sort of the best to invent a new word in that other language, just as thriveability is is really an invented word. But I, I haven't taken that up. It's there, and I explain it as I am now, but it's not fully satisfying. Well, you know, it's interesting about thriveability. It was invented by, as you know, I've told told you this story, but. Um, mm -hmm. I think when we first met, or maybe probably when we were connecting on social media, mm -hmm. but that that several people emerged in 2009 with this word independently, mm -hmm. and that I was at a t at a table with people from the UN Global Compact for Business and and other participants at the Business for Eight at the global um, at the global forum that you know I mentioned Chris 
Lutz Lilo at uh, Case Western, and Cooper Ryder, and and the uh, uh, other, you know, in, in this community, this you know very well, well known uh, community of, of forward thinking um, uh, business and system leaders that have have formed a series of conferences known as the uh, the Global Forum for Businesses Agent for World Benefit. And at our table, we were all pretty sure that we had invented the word thrivability because right. none of us had heard it before. And yeah. we were struggling to find uh, an alternative to the term sustainability and the meaning of sustainability. And we were and this was 2009, and Peter Senge was one of the participants, or one of the speakers, and he was the one that, you probably heard him say this, that, you know, where he criticizes sustainability, sustainable development goals, and what's meant by that, and, and nobody wants to kind of frame their relationships in terms of sustainability as if you have a sustainable marriage. Right. And, and, and that really, that was the first time we had heard that, and so thriveability was, was, I mean, we didn't even think of alternatives, and it occurred to like everyone at the table at the same time. It like, it's, I mean, I, I swear three of us blurted it out almost at the same time. <laughs> we wrote a song for it in a video. We performed that song, made a video out of it, and made a website. <laughs> and we tried to keep it going for about four or five years. And mm -hmm. the other people at that table dropped off. But you see where this went is it kind of grew into the flourishing. And now we've been working you know, with, with that same group um, when we had our first workshops and, and when we rolled out the canvas, it was with the uh, the uh, 2014 was it Anthony or the yeah, yeah um, glo um, uh, global forum for business. Nice. So this this has an interesting kind mm. of root structure. Yeah, with an emergence of kind of the same thriving, flourishing trees right. that that has a very that is connecting us. And so going back to roots roots and trees and your metaphor. Uh, one thing that, that kind of occurs to me because this is the way I look at our business model um, approach is that uh, an organization has seasons and I use the seasons metaphor as a way to think about the transformation of, of an organization as it goes through the hard steps of change from a, an existing business model which is defined the way that that um, relationships, um, value relationships, su supplying customer relationships have been organized for maybe decades. And to change that with a to a, uh, a progressive and a flourishing model, which actually may be a lower growth model too, and they have some very different approaches, especially to convince a large organization that they're going to go through that change. It's going to require... Um, a transformation which I like to characterize through the seasons, but mm -hmm. nobody likes to start with winter, which is a, or which or mm -hmm. autumn. You know, basically going from you know losing your leaves of the old business model, mm -hmm. getting it fallow ground where you're able to rethink it and then rolling it out. You have to have this faith to go through that process. Yeah. It isn't the only way we do it, but I'm wondering since you're using the tree metaphor, whether mm -hmm. whether mm -hmm. the, you're looking at how the season you've got a deciduous tree right so, so right. What's the, what, are your, what are your seasons in this process uh, it it does come up i have a chapter in the book about the role of death and renewal for example that thriveability doesn't only encompass the the blooming part of life and um if we only focus there, then we get in just as much trouble. So absolutely, um, that's a, a part of the conversation that's necessary. There's also uh, a model that I use sometimes that's called the panarchy model. It's sort of the figure eight that talks about the, the phases. It's very similar to the seasons as you're describing them. So yeah, it's definitely a necessary part of the conversation. Thank you. Sure. Good seeing you. Good to see you. Let, let me tell one quick story uh, before we have to go. And this is a nice one for touching on the, the definition of thriveability. So this is a, a coalition of nature museums, a, bar, a botanical gardens, an insectarium, a planetarium, and the biodome. The biodome is an immersive experience of four ecosystems recreated under one roof. 
So all in Montreal, all owned by the city. Uh, originally, they were separate institutions, and several years ago, the mayor decided to merge them administratively to save some money, um, fire some HR and finance people, and because you know they're all nature museums, what's the difference? Um, and in, in fact, to be fair, there was also a bit of vision as well that maybe together there could be one brand that would represent all of them, and it would really put Montreal on the map, like the, the Guggenheim in Bilbao, Spain, you know, sort of would have a bigger splash in the world. So for all of those reasons, they were merged into one entity administratively. And the people involved were not at all behind this. <laughs> they were not interested in being merged. They have different scientific disciplines, different histories, different sizes. The planetarium was in a different part of town. And they were very skeptical of branding. Uh, they're scientists and educators, and so they really didn't want to be turned into the next Cirque du Soleil or something, you know? So um, a new director was hired to lead this merged entity, and he's a visionary. He's a really amazing person, and he, um, he saw that it wasn't going to be enough just to create one brand. It also needed to become one cohesive culture somehow, and that the people needed to be on board for this. So he hired my colleague and me, and one of the first things we did was to bring all 450 people from the four institutions together for a day. And it was a lot of fun in particular because they are nature scientists, they're biologists, and so we could talk this language of living systems and, and be really open with them about uh, the methodology behind what we were doing. And we, we invited them to be in conversation over the course of this day in ways that brought to light those different fertile conditions that they would have to cultivate. What's it going to look like when you are working with full passion, with mastery, membership, and meaning? What is it going to look like when you're engaging visitors really deeply in these ways? And what's the infrastructure? What's that going to look like? So that was really rewarding to have a group of, of scientists to work with. So really um, all of those that conversation um, in search of these fertile conditions we, we sort of summed it up in this way we asked them what's the one conversation you all want to have with the world and this is kind of looking for the convergence you know the, the shared purpose and, and wholeness that will bring these four different scientific and um, teaching institutions together so we, uh, we listened to what they said and read all of the notes and, and went away and crafted a draft manifesto and brought it back to the directors, a, a group of about 10, 15 people, and asked them, is this what, what you all said? Does it feel authentic? And you know, what do you think? And they said, it's really good. We, yeah, yeah, we like it. There's just one problem. You used the word life. And you know, we're scientists, and so we don't talk about life, we talk about nature. Nature is, I have, I have windows here, nature is out there. <laughs> and it, we can see it, we can measure it, and, uh, and that feels very comfortable for us, but life is kind of amorphous, and uh, it might even be spiritual, so can you just change that one word? So my colleague and this director and I, we all said, wow, that's really interesting that you are, most of you biologists, you're nature scientists and you're uncomfortable talking about life. And if you can't talk about life, then who can? And maybe there's a connection between our inability to talk about life and our decreasing ability to sustain life on the planet. So maybe that's actually the one conversation you need to have with the world. If your goal is to change people's behavior in relationship to nature, and maybe it's, it's far more powerful to invite them to connect with life, even more than nature. Life is somehow in here as well as out there. So it took them really about six months of collective soul searching to come to terms with that shift. And in the end, they came up with a, a, a new identity for themselves, a new name, a single brand that they would say it's not a brand, it's a conversation. And so now they together are called Espace pour la vie, which means space for life. They retained their individual divergent identities, but together 
they form the space for life. And it's been such a powerful shift for them, not only in name, but in how they are structured. So if we go back to our framework, they changed their organizational structure um, so that, for example, human resources, which was buried within finance and administration, and that's a really common thing. Instead, it was brought out to form one of three pillars of the organizational structure. So there's people and culture now, there's visitor engagement, and there's infrastructure. So you can, you can see it's the three rows here that they formed the structure of their organization around. Passion as people and culture, purpose as visitor engagement, and practical play as, as infrastructure. They changed the way they construct their exhibits so that they are far more engaging, creating a sense of community and conversation and co-creation, and so that they touch on people's emotions much more powerfully than before and, and create much more of a sense of, of heroic cause. Um, they were able, oh, I'll just jump to the punchline, I'm seeing how much time we have, with the manifesto, with this shift in identity um, and, and the effectiveness of their operations in a very short time, um, they were able to, to raise a sizable amount of money. They had tried for, I think it's nine years, seven, seven eight, nine years to raise enough money to renovate the planetarium and, and were never able to. And um, when they released the manifesto in, in great celebration, with, within a year, they were able to raise $190 million and completely build a new lead platinum planetarium on the same site as the other three and do several other projects and it's there's just so much that's wonderful that they've been able to do and back to our discussion of the translation when i talk about um, the translation of thrivability i often tell the story of espace pour la vie as maybe the best translation there is that phrase because in the practice of thrivability we're seeing our organization as a space for life and within which we can cultivate the fertile conditions with informed intention and practice, right? So that's a quick story. Let me pause. Are there questions or comments in the chat that I'm missing? Uh, no, there's, there's, uh, I think people are speaking out loud, which is great. We're, we're okay. used to the idea that we can do that more easily than with our old technology. So good. Uh, it's great. Uh, you, you're getting some kudos uh, from uh, from Ben, who is in Montreal, uh, and uh, for that story. And uh, yeah, it's it's all good. So we have about. Uh, 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 may, may just uh, sorry. Go quick, ahead. A quick comment uh, to that. Uh, so Michelle, thank thank you so much. Uh, this is Fyodor. Just wanted Hi. to um, uh, share that it's so timely for the evolutional leadership community. And I also noticed the uh, Creative Commons contribution. So I wanted to ask your permission to use the framework for a conversation with community members. So mm -hmm. I guess the license allows us to do that, right? Yes, absolutely. Awesome, because that's, that's exactly what, what, what we needed. And you know, I show up primarily because uh, um, I, I know your work. Uh, and uh, um, uh, I haven't read the book yet, uh, but, um, you know, what, what, what I learned is uh, miraculously exactly uh, what we were looking for, but didn't know what exactly we we're looking for. So this framework is, is perfect. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Thank you. Anthony, were you wanting to say something as well? Uh, no, no, I was just actually going to ask if anybody else, we, we have about uh, seven minutes, six minutes left. Uh, before we, we typically close on the hour. Uh, so uh, do you have any final closing uh, thoughts, Michelle, or, or would you prefer to a discussion in the last few minutes? I think discussion. I've, I could talk forever, but <laughs> I'd love to hear what stands out, um, what's useful, what questions remain, even if I can't answer them in the time we have. I'd be happy to be in correspondence with people. And actually, I'd especially love to keep talking about how all of our different frameworks complement each other. So 
uh, Anthony, if you'd be willing, and if not, then I will, but to schedule another time that we can go more in depth. Yeah, so, so uh, one, one of the things that we've not, uh, thank, thank you for that, Michelle. Um, and um, uh, so let me make two suggestions to everybody as to how that might could unfold. Um, so as I mentioned in my introductory remarks, this is a, a group for the members, by the members. So we, we self-organize when we want to do things that we find of collective interest. And uh, there, are, there are two ways that uh, I could suggest that those of us interested in having this conversation with Michelle could do it. Um, one of us could post perhaps this slide here to the LinkedIn group and with the question uh, that Michelle has just posed, how does this relate to the frameworks, uh, that uh, the, the conceptual frameworks that we're all using and the practical tools that we're all using and see what sort of a conversation unfolds in the LinkedIn group. Um, and um, if, if that was to generate a sizable set of commentary, then those people who have been commenting uh, you are absolutely free to self-organize uh, between meetings, a deeper dive, which you can advertise in the LinkedIn group to all the members. Um, and um, if, if you don't have the uh, requisite privileges to, to, to do that, I can help with the, the administrative side of things. Um, so yeah, there's, um, if, if this is something that's interesting, then uh, it's, it's up to us to make it happen for us. Perfect, thank you. All right. Any any comments as we close? Yeah, just Michelle. Uh, in case uh, you remember, um, you know, if you do some deep, deeper dive in this group, uh, I'll do my best to uh, monitor the LinkedIn group. Uh, but if you could let me know, I mm -hmm. would be very happy to to join. Great. Thank you. I will. And and Fyodor, I mean, again. Uh, one of the things that we're trying to do here is link groups together who are doing similar work. And you presented to us back in, uh, in September last year, um, the work that you're doing in the, the, uh, the Institute for Evolutionary Leadership. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we would welcome the opportunity to uh, join you for some of your events and, and to have your members join us and vice versa. So if, if there are any opportunities like that, and I make that as a general comment to all of us here, if there are any opportunities to do that sort of connecting, then don't hesitate to use the group to advertise the opportunities to do that. Uh, because uh, it's only when we start to see the linkages and the connections, see the relationships, as Michelle uh, pointed out, that we can encourage the possibility for life for ourselves. Right? We have Terrific. to. Terrific. Thank you. Yeah, I'll follow up later with you on that. Uh, that there are some specific things in mind. And yeah, and, um, and, and, and it's very exciting to. Um, to see the synergies and uh, again miraculously again the, the the time the timing is perfect of, of all the different things that are coming together good so i i'll also just comment we uh, we haven't had presentations so maybe i'll, I'll start a, a little wind up here so we, we haven't had um uh, for, for a little while presentations on some of the projects that members of this group have been active on uh, so i will just do a little advertising and i apologize if this is a little self-serving uh, so the project that I initiated uh, six years ago now uh, with Peter Jones, with Stephen Davies, uh, with a number of other members of the group, um, we are presenting next month an update on the Flourishing Business Canvas work uh, and the toolkit around that, which is absolutely building, uh, helping people describe design business models aligned with this DNA of organizational thrivability. Um, and uh, we've got a lot of exciting news to share with everybody, uh, so we do hope you join. Um, the month after that, uh, we have our colleagues at the Case Western Reserve University presenting on the Aim to Flourish project. Uh, this is a project that's looking to build case studies of organizations that are proactively contributing to the realization of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, uh, and then uh, in, uh, that's April, and then in May, uh, we have, uh, some new, some updated work on patterns of flourishing and sustainable, strongly sustainable business models uh, that uh, has been done by our colleagues in Germany. Uh, so we've got a fairly packed agenda over the next few months, and, and that's I'm now taking. Uh, if people are interested in speaking, um, I think I'm now looking for speakers for November and December. So uh, if, if you want to get in, and don't let that stop you. If you've got something to share, post it to the group. 
Um, you are welcome to self-organize meetings between the monthly meetings. There's nothing to say that you can't do that uh, to promote uh, the possibility for life and thriveability for all of us. So with all of that, uh, I would like to thank Michelle for uh, just a breathtaking presentation today. Uh, we're all leaving the room smiling and happy uh, and feeling pretty good. So thank you, Michelle. I can recommend her book. Uh, we're thriving, absolutely. So thank you for, that, <laughs> for helping generate that, uh, co-creating that possibility. Uh, mm -hmm. And so I can recommend Michelle's book and I encourage us to keep this conversation going in the LinkedIn group. And uh, Michelle, if you would like to initiate that, please, uh, please do so in a, in a new post. And I will share the recording and the slides for today. Um, it probably, normally I would do it within minutes after the meeting end, end tonight, I won't be able to, but uh, within the next uh, 48 hours, the links to the slides and the recording will be available as a comment to the first post in the group. Yeah. Okay, with that everybody, it's six o'clock. Thank you all. Thank you. I've just, I've just bought the book on Amazon. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thanks so much, everybody. Bye. Bye bye, everybody. Bye. 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 Thanks. Bye. Thanks, Michelle. Thank you.